Hi, Lawrence. Yes. Hi, I'm Terry. I'm the chair for this session. Oh, hello. Welcome. Cool. Thank you so much for hosting this. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. You know, excited to be here. Excited to help out. Nice to meet you. What do you do? Um, I'm an associate professor at St. Mary's College. Um, so I teach um, education courses and then a lot of them that involve young adult literature and children's literature. Um, how about you? Uh, I am a, a teacher here in Clark County School District. Oh, wonderful. Are, wh when are so, you done or are you done for the- We are done. Uh, we are very- Congratulations. <laughs> This year needed to end. I could not do summer school. Uh, I, I I don't blame you. A lot it of is... my colleagues, a lot of my colleagues decided to to do this um, accelerated summer session that the pay was really good, but I just I could not do it. Yeah. Oh well, it has been such a challenging year for everyone, and I think particularly for classroom teachers. I can't even imagine. Um, what this year has been like so so we don't have our um presenter yet here not yet no not okay. yet um i'll email sophie to make sure that she has the the link to make sure and then i'm going to go to the but you guys are open and ready so that's good all right thanks okay uh, yes, a very challenging year. Did yeah. you guys do online for the most part? We were actually um, at the college level. We were mostly in person. They let us do hybrid, um, but they wanted us to be as in person as po um, as possible. So most of our classes had some sort of in person component. Um, the the schools in the area. Um, started off online and then went to kind of a hybrid model. And then after spring break, everyone was supposed to be back in person, but I don't think that entirely worked out the way they thought it would. Um, I can tell you from uh, my experience here in Las Vegas, the, uh, the hybrid model was worse than the in-person, or I mean, worse than mm. the, uh, the uh, uh, distance learning model. It did, it did not work. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. It, it's been just such a ter such a challenging year. And I think there was so much, um, you know, so many unknown factors and people would get frustrated, but then I think end up blaming, you know, teachers and school districts. And it's like, this is out of our hands. Like this is, you know, this is not localized. This is a worldwide, you know, challenge. We, you know, we don't know what we don't know. So. Very much so. It looked like we had our um, our presenter there for a minute. I'm here. Oh, okay. wonderful. Um, San Juana, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, that's correct. Okay, um, great. I'm Terry, and um, I'm um, chairing this session. So I'll give like an incredibly short. Um, introduction, not necessarily, you know, with your background, but just on the logistics um, for the session, and then I'll um, turn it over to you. Um, the session is 50 minutes, um, and mm -hmm. I'll give you about 40, and then I will, um, we'll segue into questions, if that makes sense and works for yes, you. Yes, that works. Thank you. 
wonderful. And you're the chair of the Orbis Pictus, correct? Yes, yes. Oh, awesome. And I am, I'm Larry. If you need anything, um, uh, feel free to just ask, just say my name and I'll pop back on. I'm going to shut my camera off for bandwidth reasons and, and okay. just go from there. All right. Nice thank to you. meet you. Great to meet you as well. Thanks, Larry. Larry, do you pronounce your last name McLeod? Yes, McLeod. Okay. And I've, awesome. I've already made you, um, made you co-host. Okay, thank you. If you, you want to present anything. I don't believe we have anyone in the waiting room and um, it is 1030 um, in Las Vegas. So let's go ahead and get started. So um, our speaker has enough time um, to present all of um, her ideas for us today. Um, welcome to the Children's Literature Session on the Orbis Pictus um, Award. And the Orbis Pictus is a nonfiction picture book award um, and they do fantastic work. Um, my name is Terry Suico and I'm the chair for this um, session. Just a few things to note before we get started. Um, the session is being recorded. We have about 50 minutes, so we'll dedicate 40 minutes um, for our presenter to speak and then 10 minutes for questions. Um, I'll kindly interrupt um, San Juana when we've hit the end of 40 minutes, um, just to make sure we have time for questions. Um, in, audience members, if you have any questions, please feel free to share them in the chat and I will ask them after the presentation. If you have any technical issues, um, please feel free to direct them to our host, um, Lawrence Larry McLeod. Um, you can do that in the chat or send him a private message through the chat. Um, and just a couple of notes on um, technical issues. The, ses the session works best if you switch your view to speaker view as opposed to gallery view. Um, and that way you are always seeing the speaker. Um, and um, for the purposes of bandwidth, if you are not presenting, we ask that you mute your mics and um, not and stop your video. Um, so that way you can just listen in. Um, I am now very excited to turn this um, session over to our presenter, um, who will introduce herself. Um, and our presenter today is San Juana Rodriguez from Kennesaw State, and she is the chair of the Orbis Pictus Award Committee. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, so today I'm going to be um, sharing with you a little bit about um, the Orbis Pictus Award, and then I want to also share with you um, some of the or last year's winners, so you can. Um, take a look at those books so but I want to start with a little bit of um, just history about the award and then um, the process that we go to because I think it's um, it's really important to know the the history and really all of the work um, that goes into an award um, into choosing award-winning books and and then I'm also going to review um, some of the 
um, responsibilities of committee members, just in case some of you are interested in applying um, to be committee members for this award. Um, so um, before we begin, I want to say that um, Orbis Pictus is one of three awards uh, or book awards that um, the National Council of Teachers of English has. So um, there's three awards, um, the Charlotte Huck, which focuses on um, fiction, and then we have Orbis Pictus focused on nonfiction, and then um, also the Award for Excellence in Poetry. And so I'm very fortunate to be chairing um, the Orbis Pictus um, Award this for this year and um, for next year as well. Um, I took over for, um, or I took over after um, Denise Davila, which some of you may know, um, and, um, and she just did great work in setting a lot of the foundation for the processes that we have for choosing the winners for um, this award. Um, and so this award is a fairly um, new award. When you think about book awards, it was established in 1989. And the purpose of the award is to promote and recognize excellence in nonfiction for children. It's um, named after Orbis Pictus, which was considered to be the first book that was actually planned for children. And each year at the National um, NCTE Conference, the winners of um, Orbis Pictus are recognized at the Children's Book Luncheon. So that's a tradition um, in NCTE. And so I want to talk a little bit more about, um, again, the committee, the process that we have for this award, and, um, and also how you can apply to become a member of this committee. And then, of course, I want to talk about the books. Um, so um, I just want to acknowledge our committee um, for um, the 2022 committee. This is the 22 committee. 2022 committee is this year's committee. And we're actually choosing um, the winners from books published in 2021. Um, and so if I'm chairing the committee. And then Sophie Ladd, who some of you may also know, and I think is in this session, is also a part of um, of our committee and she also she's also the co-chair of the committee or the assistant chair then we have dr julia lopez robertson she's at the university of south carolina she's a teacher educator uh, we have suzanne costner and she is a, a media specialist in maryville tennessee and um, dr eliza braden is a teacher educator at the university of south carolina we have Noelle Mapes, who is a teacher in New York, and then we have Jean Swafford, who is also a teacher educator. So I just wanted to um, acknowledge the committee and um, the work that we're doing this year to select the winners and also to let you know that the committee is a, is a diverse committee uh, representing different areas of the US and also different types of work. So we have teachers, we have media specialists, we have teacher educators. And so um, together our committee, um, represents just different facets in education. Um, and so um, to talk a little bit about the award. Um, so the eligibility for this award is um, we choose books that are published and distributed in the US. And any title of nonfiction literature is, um, sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm going to, is um, eligible. It we accept biographies, but we don't look, oh, sorry, we don't look at historical fiction, folklore, or poetry um, because those uh, fit under other categories. Um, and they must be um, well-written, they must be uh, well-organized and written for children in K through eighth, eighth grade, and they must be original work. And again, those are the traditional literature, poetry, and book reprints we don't consider for our award. Um, and I just want to share the awards criteria. We're really looking for outstanding books for children, and we consider accuracy. So one of the things that we've been grappling with as a committee is whether... Um, when we look at books, one of the first things we look at is does this book have a bibliography or source? Because as a committee, our responsibility is to think about the accuracy of what's being represented in the text and whether we can actually research it and know that that is actually what um, is, is accurate. And so um, 
we're looking for books that are sourced and have a bibliography. That's one of the um, first things that we look for as a committee. And um, we, don't, we don't necessarily put aside books that don't include it, but um, we, we do look for books that um, tell us where the information was gathered. Uh, we, looked at, we look at organization, um, style of writing, style of illustration, and whether it's an appropriate topic and potential contribution to K-8 curriculum. And as a committee, we also have discussions about um, looking at diverse text. And although that is not necessarily in our award criteria, it's certainly something that guides our, our, um, our work as a committee and gives us a lens in which to look at some of the books um, that we are choosing as winners and to make sure that teachers are seeing um, um, diversity in the books that we are choosing um, for this award. And so I want to talk a little bit about the process for selecting books. So um, the committee begins to accept books right after our convention, after the NCT convention. And we've actually um, are, have changed our dates to align more with that. And so um, they start trickling in around Christmas time and we begin to read um, books and we, the committee begins to read books and meets on a monthly basis. Um, so we meet on a monthly basis to discuss the books and also um, each committee member um, discusses some of their favorite books that they've read or some of their top books so far. And we do that because um, we begin to read books in December and we don't decide on a winner till the following November. So it's oftentimes those books that we get at the very end are fresh in our mind, but we also wanna make sure that we're remembering books that we have, um, that we have read really early on. Um, our committee reads over 400 books each year. I think last year we had about 460 books that we received. Um, and that's actually, when you compare it to the other awards, Charlotte Huck Award receives over 800 books that they read. Um, and then in comparison to the poetry book, they receive um, um, a much smaller number, of course. I don't, I don't think they received, but maybe 100 last year. I'm not sure of the number. So, but I know um, Orbis picked us, we read over 400 books each year. We rank the books, um, have discussions over them, take sur surveys. Um, we have a very a method of choosing our top 40 books and we bring those books to um, NCTE convention and that's where we have our final deliberations for the award. Um, when I first began on the committee, I saw myself bring in 40 books in a suitcase to NCTE with me and then later learned um, that we actually split those and you only had to bring four um, because everyone brought the different ones. So, but we end up with um, 40 books that we bring to NCT. And from those 40 books, we choose the winner. So each year, a winner is chosen. We have five honor books and, and eight recommended titles. Um, so that is the process. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just checking the, the chat. Okay. And, and to serve on the committee, we we do have open spots on our committee. So we'll have two open spots this coming year. And NCTE usually sends out the deadline. It's usually December 1st. And um, what you have to submit is just an, an application form which just says your interest, a CV or resume, and one example of a book annotation or book review about a nonfiction book. Um, and those are sent to NCTE. And, and then, um, the NCTE um, executive committee ultimately makes a decision about um, who serves on the committee for, uh, for this award. So um, there are opportunities to serve on this committee as we will have two open positions and we're always looking for um, new members to um, join our committee, again, from different facets of education. If you're a teacher, if you're a media specialist, if you're our teacher educator as well. Um, and just some of the expectations is um, the um, anyone who serves on our on our committee have to be current NCTE members. They cannot serve on any other national book committees. Um, they have to read all the books, and that is a, a really big commitment. I mean, you to, you think about you're reading 400 books. 
on top of all your responsibilities. It's a big commitment. Um, and a lot of those are picture books and they can be read uh, fairly quickly, but we do get quite a lot of um, um, nonfiction chapter books. And so um, it's a commitment to, to read all of those books and to write them and to have um, in-depth discussions about the books that we're reading. Um, we, um, as a member, you have to commit to attend the annual conference for three years, which is what the membership is on this committee. And then we, we also present sessions um, at NCT on using the Orbis Pictures books. And I mentioned earlier that the award is um, given during um, the Children's Book Award luncheon at NCTE. And so um, all of the members of the committee are in attendance. And so in addition to that, uh, we write um, book annotations for language arts. And each year the, we write up blurbs about the winners and submit those. And those are published in um, the Journal of Language Arts. Um, and I wanna share with you a little bit about um, last year's winners, so 2021 winners. And so the 2021 winners were books that were actually published in um, 2020. Okay. Saying that correct. Oh. So our book was um, Above the Rim. That was our book that was the winner, um, How Elgin Baylor Changed Basketball. And this is a book written by Jen Bryant. And if you know, Frank Morrison was the illustrator and um, it was beautifully illustrated. Um, and this tells the account of um, Elgin Baylor and his protest against racial injustice and how that led to change. And um, Elgin Baylor was one of the first African-American players in basketball and he experienced a lot of racism and had to stay in different um, hotels and eat at different restaurants. And so this book really details his activism. And um, at the committee that chose this book actually learned that um, Elgin Baylor actually passed away um, this year. And our committee sent an email and said, aren't we glad that we were able to highlight his accomplishments? Because if you look at all of the um, blurbs that were put out there about him, we, they were really focused on um, his ability to play basketball and being a pioneer in basketball, um, but oftentimes really ignoring the, his role in his fight for civil rights. And so uh, he, he passed away this this last year, and um, we are um, we. Um, I'm sorry, you can, didn't mute my email, but you can hear, uh, you can see um, that again. This was written by Jen Bryant, who is a just an outstanding author. And one of the coolest things about serving on this committee is Jen Bryant wrote every single person on the committee a handwritten note and sent to our house to thank us for the work. Um, that we put into um, selecting this book and um, in being um, selected as a winner. So, um, and then I'm gonna just talk about the honor books. Um, so one of the things that I do as a committee member is after we choose our winners, I'm always looking at other awards to see, okay, how, does, how do our selections kind of stack up against other selections? Are we all are we all pretty much, you know, on the same page about which books are the are the best books in nonfictions? Because you know, you wonder, like we did all this work as a committee, we're very knowledgeable about children's books, but you always wonder, like, how are you know what other nonfiction books are being selected? What other, and so um, one of the books that's gotten a lot of um, awards and attention this year is this All Thirteen, The Incredible Cave Rescue of the Thai Boys Soccer soccer team. And so um, that was one of the, we were affirmed with really with all of the books um, that we had really made the right choices um, for, for the committee. And um, this book tells the story of um, the 13 boys and how they were stranded in the cave. And it's just really fascinating um, to read about um, their experience. And um, it's done so beautifully and, and the the pictures that are in the book really help to tell the story. Um, another book that was selected as an honor book is Lifting As We Climb. And 
fact, this book focused on uh, Black women and their role in the suffrage movement. And so those are um, not stories that we often read about, um, but um, this book really presented us with those unheard stories and, and the role that women had in um, voting rights. Okay, I'm gonna take a look at the chat. Okay, thank you, Terry. Um, for putting the links to those books. Um, and then honor, another honor book, if you take away the honor, and to be honest, this was one of my very top books. Um, and, and the reason for that is that um, I am an um, early childhood educator. Um, I began my career as a kindergarten teacher. And very often uh, when you look at the nonfiction books, they're, they're, they're written for older readers. And so I'm always really happy when I see books that are for young learners and that are very um, high quality. So if you take away the otter, and it really, it's, um, it's a pairing of prose and research, and they talk about sea otters and preservation, and um, it, it's just done in a beautiful way. And uh, it was one of my top books from the beginning. Um, so we get, we get, when we receive for the award, we receive boxes of books from the publisher. And as soon as I got my hands on that book, I knew, you know, at, for me, that was one of my top books. And luckily, uh, com other committee members agreed. Um, and then Honeybee, and this is an, um, this is a book that has also gotten many recognitions. So um, the, the Busy Life of Apis Millifera, <laughs> and it's um, very done, very um, detailed, and it's got wonderful illustrations and really thinking about the life of a honeybee. And um, when you look at it, it's stunning to see the, the pictures and the way that they were able to capture um, the, the life of the honeybee and everything it does and its importance. And so that's um, also a book that can be used both for young readers and for you know older elementary age readers. And, and again, I didn't, I think I mentioned this award is for K through eighth grade. Um, and then I'm um, sure all of you have seen the Teacher's March. This was another one of our honor books. Um, Sandra Neal Wallace and Rich, and Rich Wallace had actually um, won the Orbis Pictus Award, um, I think the year before. And this year they were chosen as, um, as a, the Teacher's March, March was chosen as an honor book. And, um, it tells the story of Reverend F.D. Reese and um, the 1965 Teachers March for voting for Teachers March for Black Voting Rights in Selma, Alabama, and just details the courageous um, his courageous story and the importance that um, teachers have played in history. And what the committee loved being a committee of teachers is that it's really rare to see. Um, teacher's stories being being told in this way. And we know that they exist, right? And um, and so, um, but this was not something that we knew a lot about. And so we all love this book. We love the illustrations. We loved that um, it was told with such, um, you, can, you just know it was well-researched and um, the, the illustrations really matched the text for this book and they added to it and they made it even more poignant and, and important and let you know what was, um, what was happening in this story um, or in this event. Um, then we have our recommended books. Um, um, and so we have, we have um, these two books. The first one is Drawing on the Walls. This was a really interesting book. Um, this is a story of Keith Herring, um, someone I was not familiar with, but one of our, luckily one of our committee members was very familiar with his work. Um, and um, these books were actually chosen or were read during the pandemic. And so many of the books that we received, we received in digital form. So we weren't getting, right, the boxes of books um, that we were getting before. We got some, but not a lot. Uh, or we got some in digital form and then later on we were able to get in, in a physical copy. Um, but this book, um, the, the cover of it, if any of you have actually seen the, the book, it's kind of like bubbly and it's soft when you touch it. And so 
um, our committee member and in our research explained to us that that was really to mirror some of his work. And it um, really, it, it showed us the importance of, um, of how important it is to have a book and to hold it, right? So when we got the digital copy, we really couldn't see that. And it, in the cover of the book really added to it, right? Knowing that it mirrored what the, um, what the artist, um, the, his work, what it mirrored what the work of the artist. So, um, and so it, the, our committee was really adamant um, about getting those physical copies of the book so that we could examine them, we could look at the illustrations and we could um, look at the layout of the book as well. Um, then we had we had to be brave escaping the Nazis, the Nazis on the kinder transport. Um, this book, again, I think they were all my favorite, but this was um, just such a powerful book because it told the stories of the children on the kinder transport and um, and their everyday stories and how they were touched by tragedy and, of course, hope, right, because they um, were able to get to safety, um, but it, um, it's for older readers, right? And so, but it is just a really powerful book and it, it tells it through um, the lens of the, of the children. It's very well researched. The, the um, author states how he actually talked to some of the survivors in his research, um, I mean, I'm sorry, in her research for this book. Then we have all of this, all of a sudden and forever. So um, this book is actually about, um, it's actually called all of, a, all of a Sudden and Forever, Help and Healing After the Oklahoma City Bombing. And so um, the book details the, the tragedy of the bombing and then also the hope that came and the planting of trees. I mean, I'm sorry, the growth of that tree, not the planting, that's a tree that grew where the bombing actually happened and how the trees actually became a symbol for hope um, for um, those that had experienced that. And so um, it was a powerful account of, um, of what happened and then in a powerful account of how a community healed from just a terrible experience. Um, and then we have How We Got to the Moon. This book, um, it was, is amazing. If you have children that are interested in um, anything related to the moon, they're going to like this book. It's very detailed, very well um, researched. It's a pretty thick book with lots of information, but it tells you everything you want to know about um, how um, we got to the moon, the people behind it. It has detailed um, graphics that have labels that kids will love to look into uh, or, kids would like to look at. And, um, and so what I liked is um, the variety of graphics that were presented in the book and just the variety and information that were, that were presented. So it talked about people, it talked about, again, technology, it talked about some of the challenges and, um, and finally, you know, how we were able to get to the moon. <clears throat> then you have blood and Germs, The Civil War Battle Against Woods, Wounds and Disease. This was a book that we read really early on. And it is a book that focused a lot just on what it says, the blood and the germs of the Civil War. Very detailed, very gory, but very interesting. It was a book I didn't want to read, but I really couldn't put down. It, you know, you wanted to keep reading the book uh, because it was fascinating um, to learn um, about all of the things we take for granted now, right? That we um, that we don't have to worry about that were big issues during the Civil War. And um, again, it's very gory, but it's very, very interesting. Um, it was a, a um, page turner for me. Like I kept reading and reading and reading and it wasn't that I wanted to, but it was so interesting and I learned so much in reading it. And then we have Jumbo, the making of the Boeing 747. Um, this was a, this, if you have a child that loves airplanes, this is a great book. Um, even the, even the cover of the book was just interesting. If you look at it, the way the illustrations and the text are, they're very detailed. They give detailed information. There's detailed graphics about the, um, the, the airplane and information about 
how it was made and um, the, the, it has different scales that let you see different sizes. So this is um, highly recommended for any child that likes to um, read anything about airplanes. And then we have the Lion, the Lion Queens of India. Um, this was very interesting because um, this is about the Lion Queens of India, women who, whose work it is to take care of, of the lions and to care for them. And um, it was um, interesting to, for us to read it because we often think of these roles as being filled by men, but it really talked about how this is a role that is designed uh, or that is filled by women and the care that they, um, that they, or how much care they put into taking care of, of these animals. And not only that, but they become teachers in their community and teaching other people about caring um, for lions. And then we have Dream Builders. This is the story of um, Philip Freelon. And he, he is actually the architect who designed the Smithsonian National Museum of African African American history and culture. And it's his story of um, having a dream and working really, really hard to, to reach that dream and kind of beat a story of beating the odds. And um, we discussed how it's not um, typical, right, to read about these um, stories of um, black men, right, black engineer, black man who, who um, from day one, right, had this dream and worked and worked um, really hard towards it and, and, and how things just don't happen because of, of good luck, right? He had to navigate all these spaces and uh, in the end was able to, to make his dream come true. And um, lastly, I want to share with you, um, we, were, we had to think about as a part of our award, why we think it's, it's in, this award is important. And, and as I reflect, I, I worked with um, my friend Denise, who was a co-chair last year, and we, we, we really think it's important to have a space where books are vetted by really committed group of teachers and media specialists and teacher educators. And we all share um, a love for for reading the books, a love for literature. And so we hope that through this award, we're able to highlight um, extraordinary work of teachers and that teachers can feel confident in using these books in their classroom and knowing that they were vetted and that they are, you know, they meet our criteria, which is that they're accurate, that they're sourced and um, that they're just books that they can feel confident in sharing, in sharing with children across the curriculum. And so I, at this time, I'll take any questions if anyone has them. I think I probably overwhelmed them with books and um, <laughs> book links. Um, and I think they were also, people were also just taking in everything you were saying um, about the, um, committee and about the um, books that you um, chose. I'll share with you, Terry. I, I, um, and I'll share with the group. When I applied to be on the committee, I had no idea the amount of work that I was undertaking. So I, I like, I saw an announcement from NCT, and I said, "Oh, this sounds like it will be fun, you know, to read all these books." And um, once the boxes started arriving to my house, you know, you realize the amount of work and commitment that it takes to choose these books and, and to kind of see it uh, affirmed when you look at other awards and you see that our books are kind of in line with them. It reaffirms, you know, that the work that we're doing and the processes that have been established by other committees, mm -hmm. they work. Well, and I know that you mentioned this um, earlier since the, the award is for grades K through eight, mm -hmm. um, but you do get a lot of chapter books and some fairly hefty chapter books, um, if I recall. Like um, I, I remember several years ago that I think one of the winners of the, or the honoree what, books um, was Candace Fleming's um, The Family Romanov, which, mm -hmm. you know, I sort of assume is like why is more YA nonfiction than children's nonfiction. Yeah, so we look at so when we get 
the books, we have a spreadsheet that looks at all the criteria. So does it have a bibliography? And if it doesn't, does it have a uh, recognition of any um, like experts that the author talked to? Because we consider that also as part of like, how do they know that was accurate? Now, I will say the committee can decide, you know, if we really love a book, we can go with that. But for the most part, we really like for books to be sourced and have a bibliography. Um, but we can keep a book in discussion, even if it does, it doesn't mean it's an automatic disqualifier. Mm -hmm. But um, um, I don't know if any have been chosen that had, had that don't have it, the bibliography, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but in, but um, we have that process. We look at the date that is published, make sure that it's not a, a reprint. We look at the age group. So, and we check what the publisher says. We look at what Amazon says. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so we, it's all about conversations. So even though we also, we have our criteria, we're guided by our criteria. We also have the committee, you know, is able to make decisions and we have other experts. So we can always ask Denise. So if I have a question, I will ask Denise Davila or, um, or Kathy Short, who has also agreed to serve as kind of an expert, um, not kind of, as an expert, <laughs> uh, and, um, and, and others. So um, we, we, we do have a little bit of, of leeway, but the com we can also, you know, check with others to see if it meets the age or if it's not sourced, does it meet our other criteria? So, okay, any other questions? Well, and I was just gonna hop in too. Um, San Juan and I get to work together and I adore her. She's lovely. And it was my first year last year. And we also love with the teachers, they often get to share these books with kids. And since the kids are gonna be our audience most of the time, right? And the classroom teachers, we try really hard to see what kids are thinking about these texts too. And is it, we're competing with such a digital era right now. And with the books, especially like Blood and Germs, we loved it, but kids loved it. They were like, this is so disgustingly gross that we want to read it. And so we know that if kids are like, hey, we got to read this, then it's going to be a viable option too. Mm -hmm. It has to meet the qualifications, but kids are a good marker for what's going to be read. So. Uh -huh. San Juana, thanks. That was great. I love listening yeah. to all the books again. <laughs> um, I, San Juana, I have a question for you. Um, does the committee ever find it challenging? Um, because, you know, K through eight is a pretty big, you know, age range. Um, when you are comparing, let's say, a picture book to um, a more advanced chapter book, when you're thinking about, um, like, the Honeybee book versus the Blood and Germs book. It, does that ever make the um, deliberations um, more complicated or is it like um, comparing apples to oranges sometimes? That's one of the things we look at. So when we, 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 ha we look at balance. So do we have some chapter books? Do we have some picture books? Because you, you probably know we always have more picture books, right? We, we're always, but we want to make sure we also have some high quality chapter books since it is a K through eight award. And so when we're doing our final votes, that's one of the things that like, okay, let's look. I mean, we're literally sitting at a table with all of these books, right? And we're like, okay, let's look. Um, hopefully this year we will too. I don't know, we don't know yet, but, uh, or when we're meeting, you know, virtually, okay, let's look at what we have. Do we have some picture books? Do we have some, uh, um, chapter books do we have too many biographies because we get a lot of biographies and um and so do we have some also do we have some science concepts represented some because um you know i think too if it's a committee that loves a certain topic or like i know like sophie and i both love picture books right and but there's people on our committee who love those chapter books so we want to make sure that their voices also like are elevated and we listen to what they're saying you know um and so if we have to go back and reread something it gets really hard at the end um but um we will and we can we'll look at uh, take another look at maybe you know some of the chapter books so that's something we consider anything else
I'm just taking a quick look at the chat to make sure that I didn't miss okay. anything or any questions. I know that somebody said, um, Brian, I think it was you early on that, said, that you said that this um, you know, committee and being able to read all of these books sounds like a dream. And um, I completely agree. It sounds like it sometimes could be maybe too much of a good thing at times, you know, when you think about 400 uh, yeah. books, but. It, well, I'm telling you 400, but we get, we get a lot more than that oh. because we get a lot that don't even fit our criteria that we just put to the side. And um, we're so lucky and we get to sh like, you know, you get to decide what you do with those books, right? So I've been on the committee for two years and they don't fit in my office. I had to clear them out. So um, I got to donate them to the school where I used to work, you know, and, and, or do and donate them to a teacher I work with. And they just think that is like the best thing, right? And I'm just trying to get rid of books out of my office because <laughs> they don't fit. So it is honestly, it's really a, it's a dream. <laughs> I was going to say, I had said that but I, when I started interviewing authors for the, the National Writing Project's The Right Time, I just did a couple of shows and then UPS became my best friend. Like I cannot <laughs> believe the number of times a week it stops to drop off boxes and boxes and boxes of books because mm -hmm. the publishers want you to, you know, feature their writers. And, mm -hmm. and I, I live by middle school. So I, and they know me as the, the wacky, wacky guy who hands out books. Cause I'm always like, you read it. If you like it, tell me I need to, need to like promote it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's great. Um, well, thinking about that and thinking about what Sophie was saying regarding the, um, you know, trying to keep kids in mind. I feel like there's sometimes, I don't want to say a disconnect, but in there, um, people have two ways of looking at um, nonfiction. I think there are some people who like it, and there is certainly the discourse that says, you know, you know, your reluctant really readers really like nonfiction, and then there's also people who shy away from it. And do you ever have to think about that, um, you know, on this committee trying to engage both the people who absolutely love? Um, nonfiction and those who are, who find nonfiction or think nonfiction is very dry. Yeah. So Terry, in talking about that, one of the things that, um, um, it, that was really important this year is that we want to keep teachers on the committee. It, and it, even though, can you imagine being a classroom teacher and having to do all of this work, right? But we, we have, te we have a teacher, um, and then we have a media specialist on our committee. And um, so that, that, that was the one thing NCT said, okay, we're, we're gonna have to have a teacher on this committee. And they're committed to and wanna add that actually to the bylaws, which I think is really uh, important because we want kids to actually read the books. And so Suzanne, who is our media specialist, actually has her kids in the media center read these books. And she shares in our meetings, okay, I gave this to kids and like, this is what they said. And then we have Sophie who has kids who are also reading her, right, her books. And so she gets to share like, okay, I gave my, my child this and like he was not about reading it. So mm -hmm. we are able to do a little bit of that, but yes, I agree. We, um, it's important to know, okay, we want books that are also interesting to book, to kids. And so how can we do that? And this is just one way that we have figured um, out how to do it. And I'll piggyback on that too, if you're okay oh, with it, San Juana. We really, yeah, of course. the images come to the forefront a lot of the times because we're, again, going back to the notion of competing with the digital age. One of the things we loved about the moon book that we chose was that even for our undiscovered readers, there's so much in the paratext and so much in the images yes. that can be read as well that we're not specifically relying on students being able to read the words, but they can understand the concepts that are being presented through the images and so with our new committee members too we've talked a lot recently about how sometimes the writing is great but the images fall short and so then we can think about how the images will draw that 
reader in that doesn't want to think about nonfiction text because they see it as so heavily word driven. And so we've really focused a lot on that this year, I think, especially mm -hmm. because some have been like, we love the writing, but the images are awful. And I hate to even say that out loud, but it becomes a really important factor yeah. in the nonfiction collection that we're looking at. Anything else? Just a comment from the chat. Someone said that um, her students would love to be on the receiving end of a non-stop stop supply <laughs> of books. <laughs> Apply for the committees. And if you wanna even get more books, Charlotte Huck. <laughs> I think they got close to 900 books last year, but that means you gotta read all of them. I don't think we have um, any more questions, but um, then I want to thank you so much. And Sophie, thank you for your um, insight as well. This sounds like a fantastic committee and it, you are doing you know, amazing work. I've um, had the chance to attend um, some of the sessions that you do at NCTE and I always walk away with a ton of great ideas for um, to share with my students who are um, teachers in training. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, everyone. And if you're interested in applying to be on the committee, look for the call after the annual conference for NCTE. Thank you so much, Terry. I appreciate it. It's great to meet you. Oh, so nice to meet you as well, San Juan. And I will say that, you know, my, it is one of my dreams is to be on the Orvis Pictus Committee. I, I don't think I have the, <laughs> quite the right background, but, um, you know, I think that the work that um, you and Sophie and the rest of the committee are doing is so important because a lot of the students that I work with who are future teachers are scared of nonfiction. Yeah. And so I use a lot of your ideas and a lot of your suggestions to get them engaged and interested with nonfiction. So thank you. Thank you and bye. Bye. All right. Um... I'm about to end the room. If if anyone has anything else they'd like to ask Terry before we leave. If not, it's it is heading into lunch. And then I, we will see each other back at uh, twelve thirty. Larry, thank you so much. I am actually I think with you all afternoon as chair. So I'll see you after Fantastic. lunch. Fantastic. See you after lunch, Terry. Thank you. Have a good lunch. Have a good lunch.